How did you know I would bring you back home and not take you to the river and strangle you? That was the question that the strange little man asked his prospective date in 1969. When she was shocked, she pretended it had been a joke, but the young woman didn't think it was funny. When she made the man leave, she called the police, and a short time later a search warrant was obtained for the home of Jerome Jerry Brudos. When police investigators opened the door to the secret locked workshop he had built onto his house, he was arrested. And on May 25, 1969, the murders of the shoe fetish killer, a serial killer that no one knew existed at the time, came to an end. Jerry Brudos had been born in South Dakota in 1939. He was the youngest of two sons, something his controlling mother never let him forget. She had hoped for a girl and was disappointed when she got Jerry instead. Throughout his childhood, she constantly reminded him what a burden he was. When she wasn't berating him about not being a girl, she neglected and ignored him, leaving the imaginative young boy to his own devices. One day, while exploring a local junkyard, Jerry found a discarded high-heel shoe. Fascinated, he took it home with him. The start of something he would do many times in the coming years. By the time he had started elementary school, he had started sneaking into neighbors' homes and stealing women's shoes and underwear. At one point, he even attempted to steal his teacher's extra pair of classroom shoes. He was eventually caught and punished, but it did nothing to discourage his fetish. And if it had just remained a fetish, several lives would have been saved. Unfortunately, it didn't. By the time he was 17, Jerry's sexual appetites had led him to attacking two young women. He forced one teenage girl to remove her clothing at knife point so that he could take photos of her body. Too ashamed over what had happened, she refused to talk about the incident. However, the other young woman reported the attack to the authorities, and Jerry was sent to a mental hospital for treatment. At the hospital, Jerry was diagnosed with schizophrenia and blamed his mother's mistreatment for Jerry's resentment of women. He was confined at the hospital for nine months, and when he turned 18, he was released. This would prove to be a fatal mistake. Jerry returned home, graduated high school, and enrolled at Oregon State University with plans to be a mechanical and electrical engineer. He missed so many classes, though, that he was kicked out. After that, he joined the Army, but was soon discharged due to bizarre obsessions. Jerry then began working at a radio station, and it was there that he met his future wife, a 17-year-old named Darcy. The two of them soon began dating. Darcy's parents didn't approve of their daughter's relationship with Jerry, but the two of them got married in 1961. They settled down in a suburb of Salem, Oregon, and soon the couple had two children together. Jerry seemed to stay out of trouble at the beginning of the marriage and only requested mildly odd things from his young wife, like having Darcy clean the house nude except for a pair of high-heeled pumps. But the honeymoon from murder didn't last long. Jerry began complaining of migraine headaches and blackouts. The only thing that seemed to help was to go on prowls around the neighborhood at night, stealing shoes and lace undergarments. Jerry built a workroom that was attached to the house that no one else was allowed to enter. Although no record of them exists, it is believed that Jerry also began attacking women again. There were reports in the area of women being knocked to the ground and the mugger stealing nothing but their shoes. Was the attacker Jerry? No one knows, but it is possible. What is known is that Jerry committed his first murder in January 1968. Linda Slauson was selling encyclopedias in the neighborhood and made the mistake of stopping at the Brudos' home. Jerry acted interested to get her inside, and then he strangled her to death. He later admitted that he kept Linda's body in his workroom for a few days so that he could dress her up however he wanted before he dumped her in the river. Before he did, he cut off one of her feet so he could use it as a model for high heels. Once Jerry had killed, he couldn't stop. His next victim was University of Oregon student Jan Whitney. She was traveling home for Thanksgiving when her car broke down. Jerry happened to be driving by at the time and pulled over to offer assistance. Unable to get the car started, 
he offered her a ride to the nearest telephone. But once she was in his car, Jerry strangled her. Jan's body was taken to his workroom where he dressed her up and took photographs of her. Before dumping her body, he cut off part of her chest to keep as a trophy. Jerry killed two more times in 1969, claiming the lives of Karen Sprinker and Linda Sally. Just as he had with the other two young women, he brought their corpses back to his secret workroom and dressed them in lingerie and heels and eventually dumped them in the river. The final two girls would prove to be Jerry's undoing. On May 10, 1969, a fisherman near Corvallis, Oregon found a body floating in the Long Tom River. It turned out to be Linda Sally. Two days later, police divers found the body of Karen Sprinker near the same spot. Both women had been tied to auto parts to weigh them down, but it had not worked. The investigation began with detectives questioning Karen's fellow students at the University of Oregon. Several of them revealed that they had received phone calls from a man claiming to be a lonely Vietnam veteran looking for a date. Only one student had accepted his offer. She told detectives that the man acted strangely and asked her, how did you know I would bring you back home and not take you to the river and strangle you? Detectives asked her to set up a second date with the man so they could question him, and she gave Jerry Brudos, the mystery date, a call. When he arrived for the date, he didn't find a pretty college girl waiting for him. He found the police. Jerry denied knowing anything about any murders, and detectives decided to release him. For now. Something bothered them about the man, though, and decided they needed to take a little closer look. Meanwhile, other detectives were looking into cases of women who had been attacked in the area and called in one of them to look at photographs of possible suspects. Almost by accident, she picked out Jerry Brudos as her attacker. After obtaining a search warrant, detectives searched Jerry's home on May 25, 1969. It was in his secret, off-limits room where they found the evidence that would put him behind bars for the rest of his life. Inside the workroom, they found nylon rope and photos of the dead women, along with the trophies that Jerry kept, shoes, bras, and even a grotesque paperweight made from that woman's chest. Confronted with the evidence, Jerry confessed to the murders on the spot. He pled guilty in court and received a life sentence. While in prison, Jerry often wrote to shoe companies and requested catalogs. Prison authorities could do nothing about it. Women's shoe catalogs were not on the list of banned materials, but maybe they should have been. When Jerry was not perusing his collection, he was busy filing appeals to regain his freedom. But none of them worked. He died in prison in 2006 of liver cancer at the age of 67.